Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to Medieval Church History. I'm Teresa Holman, and with me is Father Michael Witt. Welcome, Father. Thank you, Teresa. We have been covering Muhammad and Islam, and today we're moving on a little bit. We are bit. heading north. We're going to be looking at the Vikings. All right. So we've been looking at the uh, the Magyars and the Muslims. Okay. And remember, had, we had one session on them making mincemeat out of Europe. And, That's right. And it would have been bad enough if they had been alone. But let's throw the Vikings in, too. And <laughs> just uh, it made for an absolute... Uh, absolute quite a party. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about the dark ages. Uh. you know. And, that, and often, I just want to... A little editorial comment here. Often people refer to the medieval period as the dark ages. Mm-hmm. That's simply not true. This is the dark ages. Mm. There are actually two dark ages. The fall of the Roman Empire itself, that's pretty dismal. Then the Carolingians sort of put life back together again for about 80 years. Then they bicker amongst themselves, and now you go into this other other period that is absolutely terrible. And so we'll be looking at the uh, the third assault then, which goes on for 300 years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's not like they just come in and and leave. But for 300 years, this was an annual event that the Europeans had to deal with, where these these Norsemen uh, coming in and and wreaking havoc. As a result, uh, it's going to bring about social, political, economic collapse. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see once again... There are very few institutions that can stand up to this, and the one that does ultimately is the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church brings about an end to this chaos by converting the, um, the Vikings themselves. So the name of this program is From Viking Chaos to Viking Conversion. All right. Okay. Well, uh, the Germanic peoples, those peoples living in Germany and France, and all, as they look north, uh, they are going to be seeing a people that is different from them. Uh, you get into all kinds of this Nordic myth stuff, too, you know, of, of uh, the similarities and all. And some of this is wrapped up in that, in that uh, ethnocentricity of, of the Nazi era and everything. But the Germans of the period, we're looking at the Franks and the Saxons and the Frisians and all those uh, tribes in, in Europe itself, when they looked north of the Baltic, they did not see themselves. <laughs> They saw a group of people that they referred to as the Scandinavians. And this is a a group of people who are, for the most part, separated by the Baltic Sea from the rest of northern Europe. Although much of northern Europe, the northernmost part of Europe, is actually depopulated uh, along the coastline. Uh, uh, around this time. Many uh, Germans had been uh, that had lived along that area continued westward. And remember the Salian Franks? These are Franks who are going to live actually in, in France. Uh, the Angles and the Saxons are actually going to continue all the way across the English, English Channel into uh, England. And so um, in, in this huge movement that goes on for hundreds of years that German historians refer to as the Volkswanderung, the wanderings of the peoples, um, part of the that area that is not going to be heavily populated is up in the North Sea area itself. So as you start looking at Scandinavian peoples who will be populating the regions north of the Baltic and then also some of the regions south of the Baltic, you have a couple groupings. First of all, we have the Danes. And if you uh, picture a map, uh, it's always good to have a, a map with you, you know, but if you can picture a map of Europe and there is a peninsula that juts out north of Germany, uh, it's called the Jutland Peninsula, or sometimes it's pronounced as the Jutland Peninsula, but uh, that's basically where Denmark is today. And the Danes uh, will settle in, uh, in in that region there. And then also there are some islands in the Baltic, especially to the east of, um, of uh, Jutland. And there's another group of people there called the Gurthar, 
and uh, they'll eventually be absorbed. So you won't find anybody running around saying, oh, I'm a gooder, <laughs> you know, um, nowadays. And they'll be absorbed by a larger group that we're very familiar with, the Swedes. Uh, okay. You know, and they'll be up in that area, too. And then as you go into that huge um, peninsula of Scandinavia over on the left side, in other words, the westernmost side, along the forest and the fjords and the valleys facing west, that area is be, will be called Norway. Again, the northern mm -hmm. uh, Nor Norway. And, and the whole region, Germans refer to the whole, everyone living in that area simply as Nordmen, the Northmen, men of the north. Well, I think I mentioned to you that before Charlemagne died, he had the spectacle of seeing an entire navy of Danish warships go right. by in front of him, something that he could not confront because he didn't have a navy at all. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Carolingians were not real seagoing people. They uh, had a couple ports, but by and large tended to be pretty earthbound. And um, and so they saw, you know, he saw this this raiding take place around 800. The Scandinavians get active. We don't know why. Uh, some argue that there was an overpopulation. Uh, you know, you can only produce so much food up in that region. Right. And if you end up with an overpopulation, you're going to have to get out. Uh, some people argue that it was a lust for silver. Uh, we do find a lot of silver jewelry and, and uh, knickknacks uh, around this time, may maybe. Maybe it was a lust for adventure. I don't know if you remember the uh, the comic strip, uh, Hagar the Terrible. Yeah. That uh, someone asked him one time, why uh, you know uh, wh why do you invade Italy? And uh, his his response was, it's sunny and warm down there. <laughs> that was you my know? thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably. Climate's a little better. <laughs> yeah. And and despite all of the. The uh, scholarly work of historians is probably something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anyway, they do uh, launch, uh, launch their, their raids. They certainly had the technology for it. Uh, what they had was a long boat. And these boats are just incredible. We know a lot about them because one of the customs they had was of burying their chief in one of the long boats. And so he would be placed, and you know, you see the uh, all the time the pictures of of the chief being put onto the boat and sent out into the fjord, and and then flaming arrows are sent, you know, and it burns out at you know sea and all that. All right. uh, and then there's some guy up on the mountainside with a big horn going do 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 do, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Um, that's a Ricola ad, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking of what it was, that Lancelot there. Uh, Siegfried. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that, that, that's an example there. But uh, actually, most of the um, the chiefs were actually buried in the boats. So they, they were put into the boats, and the boats were actually buried. And so, because of the soil and and variations, some of these boats have been uncovered. Yeah. And uh, they've been well preserved, and so we know a lot about them. Uh, so much so that, in fact, one boat called the Gottstadt boat, uh, it was uh, ex excavated, and then it was replicated. They built it exactly as it was, as it had been found from centuries earlier. That boat was actually used to go across the Atlantic Ocean to prove that it was possible to do. Oh my gosh. In the 800s, this uh, these would have been uh, in the 800s. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, what we know about them is that they were, by and large, around 65 feet long. So they're a rather wow. long boat, you know, uh, rather narrow. They're single hull, so that there's no deck. Mm -hmm. uh, it, think of it as a, a great big long canoe, mm -hmm. not wide, but real long. But it's a little bit, it's long, uh, wider than a canoe, maybe twice the width, 30, three times the width of a canoe. But think of it as 65 feet long. That's, what, a quarter, almost a third of the length of a football field? That's what I was just going to Yeah, that's, you know, that's one way of looking at it. They used oars, and they also used sails. So you could use one or the other, or you could use both. And they were powered by anywhere between 40 and 60 men. Wow. Um, and top speed was about 10 knots. So it, it's a good clip. It, it's mm -hmm. faster than you could walk, uh, sort of a, a trot. Um, but when you think about having 40 to 60 of these hairy, smelly men 
in a boat boat that sixty five feet long if there's one on each side that leaves about two to two and a half feet per man so they're they're tucked in there pretty tight and and the other thing too about them is that not only were they sea going but they were also very shallow draft so that they could actually even with that many men they could actually go into a a stream as long as they had three feet or more of water that's all wow so what that does is it opens up all of the rivers of Europe mm-hmm. and the rivers of Europe of course are incredibly important for commerce but every river now becomes an easy entryway for these Viking boats to come in and make raids and so we see that some in for instance in France we'll see interior cities like Cambrai and Seine and Chartres and Fleury and even Orléans itself are witnesses to Viking raids wow. right into the interior of the country. When it was necessary, when they they got to the point where they they couldn't row, they, they, the streams got too small, they were able to get out and actually tow the boats, mm-hmm. yeah, so they could they could tow them to to better waters. Um, at one point. Uh, in the late 800s, they come up with the idea of uh, taking out some of the men and putting in horses. So, you know, again. On these boats? Yeah. Could oh you imagine? God. Yeah, I would be no. scared to death. I've been in a canoe with a dog before, <laughs> and I know how dangerous that can be. But if you can imagine, they actually had horses, and um, and they would bring these horses into these estuaries, into these rivers, and then they would mount them and use them as raiding parties. Uh-huh. Uh, they didn't fight on the horses. That, that's important for us to know. Uh, they didn't have the technology. We talked, I think, a little bit earlier. We certainly will be talking about um, the, the Frankish technology of being able to fight on a horse. They didn't have that, but they did uh, uh, use horses to raid. In fact, one of the really important raids took place in 885. And there you had a group of Vikings that attacked East Anglia in Britain, the region of East Anglia in Britain, and they had raided this whole area with horse raids. And they had transported these horses over the the um, the English Channel. Uh, you know if that I is. I think you get the horse. I guess relaxed enough to sit in a boat I like guess that. I give them a big beer or something. Exactly. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. You know, I've been on the English Channel a couple of times in these great big, huge, uh, you know, interchannel uh, ferries, and uh, the one time was a pretty nice trip. The other time. I, that was kind of exciting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't uh, real excited about going outside in that weather. I could imagine. I mean, they, they must have been, they must have lucked out and had an easy trip across. But um, anyway, it just goes to show wow. you uh, the daring of, of these guys. Uh, there's another raid in, uh, in 864 that goes to France, and here you have, once again, where they actually abandon their ships, they took to raiding by horse, and uh, they're very inventive people. And at one point, some of the locals put up some opposition and actually raised some militia against them. And for a while, they found themselves now on the defensive, and the Vikings found themselves building a fort. Oh, my goodness. And fighting off fighting off the locals. And then uh, later on, were able to continue uh, back with their raiding again. Wow. In uh, 888, there was another terrible set of raids that took place. Um, give you some idea of some of the cities that burned in that year. Cologne, oh. you know where, where the oh. Pope was last yeah. year. Cologne, Rouen, Nantes, Orléans, Bordeaux, London, York. All of those major, not today, of course, major European cities, they are all burned by Viking raids. The people were traumatized, mm-hmm. as you can well imagine, yes. and they turned to their um, civil authorities, and the civil authorities were practically useless. They didn't have any kind of boats that could stop these boats. They didn't have any kind of way to defend all that territory against these raids. And what they ended up resorting to, by and large, was the kings and dukes and counts of the area basically bribed 
these raiders to go someplace else, which of course was just fuel to the fire. Right. You know, hey, we don't even have to come in here and rape and pillage. Mm -hmm. These guys will pay us not to, and we'll just turn around and go someplace else and, and do it over there. And we um, might come back later, I'm assuming. Uh, next year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. These were shark time deals. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. So, and then in some cases, uh, isolated monasteries where they were able to, paid off some raiders. But, you know, like you say, after a while, the, the money runs out, and these guys come back for more. So, um, and, and, and then uh, you also have cases in which, uh, I mean, they're, they're, they're not just coming in and burning places down and whooping it up and having a good time. They're also kidnapping people, mm -hmm. and sometimes lots of people, because they'll sell them as slaves. Yeah. Uh, there's a case in uh, 860 in which a, uh, a group of black Moroccans were sold as slaves in Ireland. Isn't that a riot? Black Moroccans. This are is sold. from Morocco, North oh Africa. Oh my gosh! And they had been captured by Vikings, and who then, then transported them in these in boats Ireland. up to Ireland. Oh my gosh! Yeah. In war, they were terrible. Uh, we get the word from the uh, the word in English from the Swedish berserk. If someone goes oh, berserk, mm -hmm. they were known as berserkers uh -huh. because uh -huh. that's how they acted in war. They were uh, they went wild. And you can imagine one of these big blonde guys coming at you, you know, <laughs> Hulk Hogan, uh -huh. and uh, and he's got ugly weapons, and, and he's berserk. He's crazy. And uh, your first thing, even if you're a soldier, is, uh, I'm going to get out of here. And usually lines broke without having to put up a fight. Or if you did put up a fight, it didn't last very long. And, uh, and, and, they, and they were just as bad in victory as they were in war. Um, because after they won, then the next thing they did was they, they got all the stuff that they had won, they put it all together, and then they ate and drank themselves drunk and, uh, and celebrated their, their victories, talking about what great warriors they were and, and, and all. And during that drunken stupor, these are, they're, not, they're not nice drunks. Mm -hmm. There's some people that are just, you know, become very pleasant when they're drunk. <laughs> Vikings were not among that group. Mm -hmm. uh, they were ugly drunks. And uh, there's an example in uh, an incident that took place in 1012 in which the Archbishop of Canterbury had been kidnapped by them. And it was their intention to ransom him back to Canterbury. The, the, the diocese would have paid a lot of money to get their bishop back. Mm -hmm. Instead, in the middle of the drunken orgy, somebody turned around and took a, uh, a bone he'd been chewing on and he threw it at the Archbishop and whacked him upside the head. And everyone thought that was really funny. And they all took animal carcasses and beat him to death. Oh, my goodness. You know? So, I mean, so instead of getting, they could care less about the money. They were there for fun. Ugh. But they were not content, even as they spread throughout France, throughout Britain, even into parts of Germany. And their raids continued on so that by the into the 860s, you have raids all the way into Spain Vikings appearing in the western Mediterranean. And like Hagar says, it's nice and sunny down there. <laughs> Here, they were less successful because they were bumping up against uh, Muslim pirates. <laughs> so the two groups were kind of sort of chewing on each other. Okay. There. Well, with time, some of them got the impression that maybe it was better not to go back north during the winter, typically every year uh, they would come down into Europe, raid throughout the spring and summer, fall, they would gather this stuff up and go back to Scandinavia for the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple things in mind here. First of all, why would you want to go there in the winter? for winter? Right. Yeah, right. And, uh, and, and the other thing is, what's the point? You know, why not just stay in the field? And so with time, they got the idea of doing that. And, for instance, in, um, in 835, there was a group that uh, did, did not leave Ireland. It stayed there in Ireland. And uh, in 843, there's another very sad history of a monastery in western France. It's uh, on a little peninsula, sort of an island called uh, Normotier. And... Um, there was a little monastery there. Uh, it was the monks of St. Philibert. And uh, 
the first time they were attacked was in uh, 819. And and wow. it, the, the monastery was roughed up pretty badly and, and, and all. And then finally, when when the Vikings came back a second time to the island or the peninsula of Mortier, uh, Noir Mortier, they then left. The monks left, and and they went inland and they found another place and built a monastery there. The next year they got attacked. Oh it, this went on for five times, five times, and finally in 875 was the first year that the monks of St. Philibert were able to have an entire year without having been attacked by uh, these Vikings. They found, as, as one of the chroniclers say, a place of tranquility. Mm. Uh, one of the interesting things about Noir Mortier uh, this past year is that that was the beginning point of the Tour de France. Oh, was it really? Yeah. I, when I saw that on, on the maps, the, uh -huh. you know, the cycling maps, I thought, well, I wonder if anybody knows uh -huh. <laughs> the uh, the That's Viking history of this place. Yeah. Well, it became, as I say, more and more the custom to stay. And if you're going to stay, then um, you're going to be away from your family. No, bring them along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, more and more, the the Vikings sent for their wives, their children, and so they. Um, they're, you see, they're sort of taking on a more permanent kind of position. Um, in 888, there was a group of Vikings that camped outside the city of Paris. Now, Paris had some very high walls, and they couldn't attack the city. And so the city was safe okay. all throughout the, the winter. But the Vikings kind of, they started running short of food, you know. But they also had a lot of gold and silver that they'd stole from everybody else. And so some very brave merchant from Paris went outside and said, Hey, you want to do some trading? And before you know it, Paris was supplying them with all of their winter needs. Wow. And they, of course, were paying, you know, far with cash. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty good, pretty good process for them. Now, not only that, but besides these guys being warriors, Europeans began to realize that they were also, they also had other skills. These guys were carpenters. Mm -hmm. You know, they were skilled carpenters because not only did they have to build... Good boats. Yeah, good boats. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely good boats, but also good houses up in Scandinavia. Oh, yeah. Got to stand that way. So. Mm -hmm. And and so um, the art of, of joining is something that they're very good at, at, at pulling together two pieces of uh, of wood into a, into a, a single tight, tight yeah, uh, grip, grip. And so they were excellent uh, joiners. They are also very good blacksmiths. And they found out they're very good farmers because up in Scandinavia, you've got a very short season. you got to plant. Uh, it's not real rich soil. you got to do what you can. Down in France, whoa, you got some great soil, wonderful climate, and they found that they were very good farmers in the process. All three of those skills lead toward domestication. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a tendency toward that. Also uh, involved in it, too, is there are rough-and-tumble people. They're rough-and-tumble with each other as well as everybody else, and that makes them um, their family feuds. There are guys that kill other guys and have to leave, uh, exiled, or, or they're fleeing from the law. We'll see some of those. Um, some, some of the great um, missionaries from Scandinavia actually were on the lamb. Oh. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, about that a little bit later on. But... Um, so they begin settling down because they don't want to go back. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, they're used to not a lot of people being around. So they begin settling in areas that are not particularly uh, high property valued regions. Like, from, for instance, in Scotland, they look around and say, they want the northernmost part of Scotland. Mm -hmm. Which most of the Scots say, oh, good, take it, you know. <laughs> it's yours. Um, so they'll populate the Shetland Islands, the Faroe Islands. Mm -hmm. You know, even in the warmest weather, that, that stuff's pretty, it's pretty tough. good for them. They, uh, they, they go to Iceland. There's a reason why it's called Iceland, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> uh, they go to Greenland. Uh, there's a reason why it used to be, called, or it used to be <laughs> green, but it, 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 that changed. Um, Ireland. Okay. In Ireland, they will found the city of, not find the city, but found the city of Dublin. Dublin is a Scandinavian city. That's funny. I mean, most of the Irish are probably not real proud of that, but <laughs> it's, it's a fact. Uh, so is Cork, and so uh, is Limerick. Cork, really? Yeah. 
These were founded by Scandinavians. Interesting. There's a real wonderful um, ad that the Irish government plays every couple years for tourism's sake, and it gives a a 30-minute history of Ireland. Mm -hmm. It says, oh, Ireland was attacked by these people, and, and the Vikings came in, and the English came in, and this group came in, and that group came in, and all that. And they said, you know, so many people have invaded Ireland over these many centuries, but you'll be the first ones that have been invited in. Uh. You know? <laughs> well, the Vikings were certainly not invited in, but that didn't stop them. Uh, even in Russia, <laughs> when you go to the other side of Europe, uh, Vikings are, are there, uh, down in Kiev. Uh, chroniclers begin uh, telling of their of visits by Viking groups in Constantinople. Wow. But, of course, the biggest impact would be in, uh, in Britain and in France. It's the, the mother load is going to be in those areas there. It's the Vikings that will destroy, really, the Angles and the Saxon kingdoms that are set up uh, one after another. Only one Anglo-Saxon kingdom is going to survive uh, the onslaught, and that's going to be Wessex, and that's because of uh, King Alfred, uh, and, and he'll take a stand. In his um, his book, The Glory of Christendom, Warren Carroll talks quite a bit about uh, Alfred uh, the the Great and how he and um, and Alfonso. Uh, in Portugal and in, in Spain, those two uh, stand up and, and, and do more to defend uh, civilization in, in those two regions than, than anybody else. Uh, he has a wonderful little quote. He says, that handful of inspired laymen who in ultimate crisis have saved under God the church and Christendom. Uh, Warren Carroll, has, he goes into some length talking about both of these, Alfred and uh, Alfonso, hmm. and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting read. Keep in mind that there is no such thing as a united uh, Viking kingdom. Everybody is pretty much in raiding parties, working through their tribes. Um, they, they gather around, several hundred will gather around a king. Uh, the, the term for that is a jarl or a jarl. And, uh, and and so they, it, it's much like the earlier Germans had been. It was, it's an individual kind of a rule, and it's not necessarily dynastic. You know, it's it's in that particular group, whoever is the most charismatic uh, will will rule, and uh, and th that's one possibility. Then there's another possibility that develops also, which is quite unique, and that is what we could refer to as noble republics. And this is where Viking noblemen would get together on like an annual basis at a particular spot, and there they would pass legislation for everybody for the rest of that year. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. And uh, probably one of the best examples of that is actually in Iceland. In the center part of Iceland, there is a, uh, a region where uh, it's actually it's a, a geographic anomaly. It, it's where two plates, tectonic plates come together and, and actually have ground together and it's all part of that sub-Atlantic uh, plate um, and, but, but in Iceland it's actually there and you can walk, it, it's a really interesting walk, you can actually walk through, it's a couple hundred yards, through the, the, the point where the two plates come together. Oh my gosh! You're pretty safe, but uh, yeah, but unless you're there at the wrong you're, time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you're there at the wrong time, well, you don't have long Too to bad. go. Too bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but there it is, and then there's a there's a valley off to one side called the Thinkfellir, and in that valley, that's where the Icelandic Republic. Uh, had its foundations. That's where the nobles from all over the island would come together and legislate for that year. It's it's really quite fascinating. It's a beautiful waterfall off to one side also. Uh, so if you're ever in Iceland, it, it's worth a, a little trip out to the Thinkfellir. Uh, I'll to put that somewhere on my list of to-dos, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, in Scandinavia, there is larger uh, consolidation. So you do have the development of Denmark and ultimately a king that rules all of Denmark. Uh, you do have the development of Norway and a kingdom in Norway. And the Swedes eventually, of course, will, will become Sweden and in the process also absorb this people that I would mentioned before, the guitars. Mm -hmm. okay. um, 
England is interesting. A little bit later on, uh, in Viking England, we're going to see two men, uh, one in Viking England and then one over in Scandinavia itself, two men who have the name Olaf. And, and the first Olaf that we'll talk about a little bit later on, uh, his name is Olaf Tryggvason. Okay. Okay, and, and Olaf Tryggvason uh, returns to Norway a uh, little bit, and I'll say some things about him a little bit later on. Um, he has, a, a, there's another contemporary of his who stays in England, and his name is Sven. Uh, and, it, you know, they use, often use um, nicknames for these guys. His, so his name is Sven Forkbeard. Okay. So obviously he has a beard like a fork. Um, and his son ends up becoming the king of Viking England. And he's rather well known as King Canute. Okay. And it's King Canute who uh, is very Catholic himself and converts much of Viking England to Catholicism. So much so that he goes on a pilgrimage. King Canute himself went on a pilgrimage to Rome and visited Rome in, in 1027. Uh, he'll also be present for the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperor, Conrad II. Uh, so he gets around, uh, and, and later uh, he'll also be um, be named the King of Denmark. So we the have King Canute. King Canute, yeah. In King Canute, we have the possibilities of a um, transnational Viking king. Uh, there's, there's this possibility. Uh, it, it's under him also that, that you have the conquest of Norway, so the extension there, and then, um, and then extending um, context even as far as Estonia in, in the Baltic. Uh, founds monasteries, he founded several monasteries, he prescribes laws, um, and so by the time he dies, by the time King Canute dies, there is at least a commercial empire that runs all the way from Britain in the west, all the way to the, the Baltic states, to La Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania in the east. Wow. And then after his death, there is a restoration of the Germanic, at least a part of the Germanic uh, England, uh, that being through, once again, the House of Wessex. And here you have Edward the Confessor coming on the scene. And just doing a, a quick run-up, um, you have, um, oh, ultimately, Harold trying to hold together the Anglo-Saxon kingdom. The Danes eventually try to get back to England, try to put England back into this empire that Canute had put together. They attack. They're defeated by Harold. Um, and then he finds out that, that just as he's winning this victory, that there has been a landing in southern England uh, by a, a group of uh, Normans. And this, of course, is going to be William the Conqueror, uh, Battle of Hastings, 1066. Uh, William the Conqueror is interesting. He's a Norman. The term itself, Norm man mm -hmm. from the north. So once again, we see that the Normandy in France itself has Viking roots to it. Mm -hmm. you know. And that's another story of another set of raids that had taken place a couple of generations earlier in which uh, Vikings had come down into the Seine River, into the Loire River, and uh, made these raids. Um, they were eventually defeated by the Burgundians, and they were not able to go any further to the east, and so they, they fell back. But they, in 9-11, uh, they burned the city of Chartres, just for the fun of it. In 918, the king of France tried to bring an end to these raids, and what he did was he offered to um, the Viking king, a man by the name of Rollo, he offered him a whole peninsula and said, here, you guys take care of this. The, the king, by the name, his name is Charles the Simple. <laughs> and and he, he basically, uh, it was a pretty simple plan. What he simply said was, here, 
take this land between these two uh, rivers along this same estuary. It's yours. You can have it. But you better defend it because Vikings are coming. And Rollo goes, well, wait a minute, we're Vikings. He goes, oh, yeah, that's right. So you better defend your land against your friends. And with that, he was able to put a buffer between what's left of the Carolingian France and the Viking raids by putting a Viking dukedom mm -hmm. right there in Normandy. It was a pretty smart move, pretty, really. That's pretty good. And he sweetened the pot by, um, uh, by giving them the Diocese of Rouen. And so that becomes then part of Normandy. Mm -hmm. And as you see, you know, this happens in what, um, 918? Okay. Uh, a little over 120 years later, 150, 40 years later, uh, his descendants now are powerful enough to invade England mm -hmm. and, and to take over England. There were other raids that were going on uh, simultaneously in 970. The uh, great um, pilgrimage site of Santiago de Compostelo was uh, raided. And then for four years afterwards, every year they came back. In uh, 1018, the city of Poitou was, uh, was burned. Uh, this in southwestern France. In uh, Earlier than that, in 1006, the city of Utrecht up in uh, the Netherlands was burned. But ultimately what's going to tame these Vikings and help them settle down is going to be the missionary work that will take place. So I'd like to spend the rest of our time talking about the church's reaction to these Viking raids because it was proactive. Okay. You know. Think about it. You know, around 1000 A.D., Christianity had lost the Holy Land, Syria, present-day Turkey, Asia Minor, Egypt, Sicily, North Africa, even most of Spain, to Islam. Um, that's, that's a horrible loss. Those were the birth grounds of Christianity. Right. Now all of that's lost. But if you were Pope sitting in Rome, and of course you're looking over your shoulder too because those Viking raids, and you're hiding down in the Lionite City, right? Um, if, if you're looking around in 1000 A.D., as, as Pope Sylvester II would have been doing, um, he would have seen also, with all of that loss, the church also had brought in to the fold uh, Poland, Russia, Hungary, Denmark, Iceland, and Norway. And a lot of this happens because of uh, very brave missionary work and, of course, martyrs' blood. Mm -hmm. Because for Christian, Christian missionaries to go into the Viking lands was not only just a religious act, it was also a political act. These Viking jarls, these Viking kings, were also priests of their own particular religious cults. And so to challenge their religion was to challenge them. them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's, it's going to take quite a while before these kings relinquish that religious side of, of their duties and come to recognize Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it, it's, it's not going to be easy. It's going to happen, but it'll take a couple generations. Interestingly enough, in the first uh, generation, two generations, the missionaries succeeded in convincing the Scandinavians that Jesus was God, that Jesus Christ was God. They were not able to convince them that he was the only God, that uh -huh. there is but one God. So they uh, adopted Christ as one God among others. Uh, only in the next generation or two do you find that they actually accept Christ as the Son of God, understanding the Trinity as we understand it today, and then what happens to their other gods? They're kind of demoted and they become spirits or, or demons or spiritual forces in their life. There's a lot of, and then that really fuels a lot of superstition within Scandinavian culture. Mm -hmm. And those gods, in a sense, then survive in, in, in that form, at least for a while. There had been early contacts toward conversion. This was mainly through the efforts of the uh, German missionaries 
and very special among us, uh, among these are St. Ansgar, um, who is living from 800 to 865. And it's he who is sent then to found the city, the Archdiocese of Hamburg. And the idea behind that was that Hamburg then would be a launching pad for missionary work all throughout the Baltic uh, Sea area. Uh, one of the things that St. Ansgar uh, recognized was the importance of indigenous clergy. And so he took advantage of the custom that the Scandinavians had of selling um, slaves, including their own. If you had too many children, uh, you sold some of your children off as slaves. Yeah. And Ansgar These thought, well, tough people. No, aren't they? Oh, <laughs> it gets worse. If you get old and can't work, whang, <laughs> there's no Social Security for you. Oh, my gosh. Uh, put you away. Um, but uh, wh one of the things he, he did was he thought, well, God works in mysterious ways. So he got money together. He went to some of these slave markets and bought these Scandinavian boys who he then freed and then invited them to stay on and to learn the Christian faith and many of them became um, priests and oh, missionaries and so smart. we're able to reach yeah pretty clever you know the same thing uh, Gregory the first had once considered doing the same thing for England mm -hmm. uh, but but there you have uh, this happening and and uh, the Pope at the time Nicholas the first Nicholas the Great had done everything he could to encourage St. Ansgar in this region. Um, Nicholas, as we'll see later on, had his hands full. There's a reason why he's called Great. And he had his hands full, but one of the things he's going to do is encourage this initiative toward the north. But it's going to take a lot of time. And ultimately, it's not going to come through German missionaries. The real conversions are going to come through English missionaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of influence from British Catholicism, and that's going to have to wait an entire, an entire century. Wow. You sort of think of you know the the film The Mission, mm -hmm. and the efforts that were made. You know, as we've often talked about before, um, the, the the film itself, The Mission, is is uh, uh, conflated. Everything is pushed together. But it's a series of events that happens over about 150, almost 200 year period. And when you think about those first early attempts by the Jesuits and how difficult that was, but they never gave up. They kept at it. And the same thing is also true with the Scandinavians. Uh, the constant attempts, 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 and then something broke. And and what it was was the Olaf that I had mentioned uh, a little before. Yeah, they're Olaf. Yeah, this is Olaf Tryggvason. Okay. Right. And, and uh, Olaf Tryggvason starts out as a, a very unfortunate boy. Um, his uh, his father is killed even before he's. Um, his father is killed even before he is born. His mother then marries a another um, Scandinavian. Uh, <laughs> you just wonder about this this guy. Uh, his name <laughs> is Thorlof. Laus beard. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay. What's that moving in your beard there, huh? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that that's fine for a couple of years, um, and then uh, both of them are killed by their local community. Okay. Father and mother are killed. Father and step uh, stepfather and mother are killed because they were uh, too old to work after they had been captured as slaves. So, like you say, this is a pretty rough group. Man. Olaf himself is sold as a slave. He's just a little boy. And he's sold as a slave. And eventually, he finds himself in the courts of Russia. Well, okay. And um, he, he, by the time he gets 18 years old, uh, he has the eye of Vladimir of Russia, who, for his 18th birthday, gives him a warship one of those boats okay. and he goes uh, go have fun go raid the, the Balkans and so Olaf goes off and does that now he's raiding around doing a good Viking work having a grand old time and sending a little bit back every once in a while back to Vladimir but by the time he's in his early 20s he is now invading he is now raiding England itself and in 994 
he finds himself overwhelmed by someone that he attempts to overwhelm. And this is the Bishop of Winchester. Oh. And the Bishop of Winchester reaches his heart and baptizes him. Ah. And Olaf now turns to Catholicism. And with that, he goes back to his homeland, back to Norway, along with another uh, Viking priest who has now made a bishop, uh, Bishop Siegfried, and uh, who also had been a, uh, a Norseman, who as a young boy had been raised by Christians in England. And these two then go back to, to Norway and proclaim Christianity. And Olaf immediately is accepted by the people as their king. Um, he is an incredible athlete and a great warrior. And so he's like, they all just admire him right away. He has relatives that remember him. You know, okay. but sorry to hear about your mom and dad. You know, yeah. <laughs> sorry to hear you sold in slavery. You, know, you understand. And he understood. Um, and they welcome him back. And he uses this as a platform then for the conversions that take place. Wow. Uh, <laughs> remember, this is a rough and tumble yeah, world form of Christianity. Uh -huh. And at one case, there had been a, a dispute, uh, a debate between some pagans and uh, a Christian in Olaf's kingdom. And uh, as, as the debate got hotter, uh, the Christians settled the debate by taking out a sword and killing the pagans. And um, thereupon, everybody else in town converted to Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> and Olaf did not raise a finger. Ooh, okay. No. Like I say, it's a rough and woolly <laughs> Catholicism going on here. Um, King Olaf sent a, a priest, a uh, man by the name of Father Thangbrand, uh, to, it, throughout Norway in order to found a, a parish, okay. which he does. Um, actually, he's not Norwegian. Um, he's actually a German who had lived in England, but because he had killed somebody in England, he fled to Norway, and there he found religion and was converted and became a priest, and so he... He then goes ahead and uh, is uh, uh, sent to this parish by King Olaf. The parish is very poor, mm -hmm. and they have no way of paying for the things that they need. And so Father Thangbrand falls back on what he knows best. And he puts together a parish raiding party. Oh, no. <laughs> they went out conducting Viking raids until finally the bishop got hold of them and said, Look, you know, <laughs> this is not the way we have do you thought it. about bingo? You know, something <laughs> else. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> Father Thangbrand evidently thought that, um, uh, that this was cramping his style a bit, so he volunteered to be a missionary. And so he went to Iceland. Um, and there in Iceland, he began converting people until he was confronted by a very volatile uh, pagan whom he killed in a duel. <laughs> <laughs> and many of the Icelanders then converted to Catholicism. <laughs> One of those who converted was a man by the name of Leif. Oh. And he was the son of Eric the Red, uh -huh. and hence the name Leif Erikson, uh -huh. the discoverer of Iceland. Uh, at one of the gatherings at the summer of 1000 at uh, Thinkfilair, uh, all the nobles gathered together. The question was, should we all become Catholic or should we not? And ultimately, the debate that went back and forth led to the, the vote, yes, we will all convert to Catholicism, but there are a couple things that we want to hold on to for a while, and um, we'll see. Uh, we might give them up, we might not. And, uh, and here you have uh, uh, politicians compromising with doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, what they did not want to give up was um, infanticide. Oh, my gosh. And so they continued killing their children. Uh, this would continue on for another couple generations until finally they could come to understand that this was impossible. Uh, you can't do this and be Catholic. Uh, That's but just amazing. Some habits are hard to give up. You I know, know. Right? Yeah. Wow. So I guess you could say that, um, that uh, Iceland had some um, pro-infanticide uh, politicians. 
God. Yeah, and who wanted to be Catholic at the same time. Well, let's not go there. So, yeah, let's not. That's <laughs> um, obviously a misguided understanding. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes yet another generation, and there's a gentrification that takes place. Another generation, another Olaf, uh, who comes along, and um, this man himself, as a young man, had been a follower of a Viking warrior, so he himself was a, in a warrior band. Uh, his, his, uh, he followed Thorkill the Tall. Um, who is actually, a, Thorkill doesn't sound like a very nice name, but um, he's actually uh, a, a pretty uh, good Viking. Uh, he's, he helps to, as best he could, to save England from a, uh, an evil um, a Viking by the name of Sven, who attacked the um, Anglo-Saxon kingdom led by Ethelred, uh, mm. whose nickname in history has become the Unready. For, for obvious reasons, ultimately the good guys lost in this, and uh, they fled to Normandy. When they got to Normandy, they found all these Viking Christians, mm -hmm. and uh, Olaf and others then converted to Christianity. Um, his name is is Olaf Harold's son, and here is a man who would not only converted to Christianity, but was really taken with Christianity. And he adopted a, uh, a zeal for bringing Christ to others. He felt that he should go back home, uh, which he does in 1016. Now we have a, another Olaf returning, and again, another generation later, the people turn to this Olaf and proclaim him as king. Unlike Olaf uh, Tryggvason, who was a pretty rough and woolly guy, uh, this Olaf believes that he can spread Christianity through through wise ruling, through persuasion, through missionaries. And, um, and so uh, King Olaf II then brings to Norway a whole different approach to the spreading of Christianity. And ultimately, uh, he will be proclaimed Saint Olaf. We're going to see in the 11th century a number of kings and queens who will be saints. Some of the great medieval uh, rulers were themselves saints. And uh, it was that perfect convergence of, of Christianity and political power mm -hmm. for the good of people. I mean, we, we've got so many we can look to uh, that, that uh, give us examples of this. Up north, this is, this is one example. I think that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, uh, first of all, the way that, that uh, St. Olaf died, uh, but also the fact that um, we've lost a lot of our Scandinavian, we, I'm saying Roman Catholics, have lost a lot of our Scandinavian um, relations because the Reformation had gone so heavily for Lutheranism. Mm -hmm. And so King Olaf is, is not held in the same esteem that uh, he really deserves right. uh, among the Catholic community. He spread Catholicism, Christianity, to this region. And, uh, and you know, we need to uh, continue honoring him. The reason right. I say that is because as I was doing some just preliminary research, I mean, you know, uh, Warren Carroll has some wonderful things to say about both of these Olafs. But when you get to something like uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, uh, the New Advent, there, there's not a lot there. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the other um, earlier encyclopedias, they just sort of skip over them, like, well, he's not one of ours. Well, yeah, he, is. he is. Yeah, mm -hmm. he is. Anyway, he, he died in battle in 1030 uh, A.D. Um, he, he died uh, in, in a, a battle called uh, Skittlestat uh, against the, uh, the Viking English ruler, King Canute. Oh. It's a shame. These are both good men. And, and they were both good, solid Catholics, and they ended up fighting each other over who was going to control um, the um, uh, the region of, uh, around uh, uh, the Bal uh, Baltics. So he ends up dying as, as a result of Viking violence, Viking against Viking, Catholic against Catholic. Thirteen years later, uh, another German... Uh, bishop is going to look to the north and suggest down to Rome that a metropolitan see be established in this region. That's going to be the Archdiocese of Uppsala. 
And the man who's going to suggest that is St. Adalbert. Mm -hmm. and, and what they're going to do is they're going to go to the ruins of a royal pagan palace and level that. And using the foundations, they're going to build a cathedral of Uppsala. And their Christianity is going to continue to thrive and to spread all throughout this northernmost region. So just step back, see what we've seen here now. Um, is that you know by the mid portion of the 11th century, the 10 hundreds, uh, you have the Magyars who are terrible, uh, a terrible canker, a, a cancer on Central Europe, have now all converted and become the the, the Hungarians who are right. great Catholics, uh, and and you have the the Vikings who for 300 years were the scourge of, of uh, Europe and now convert and become great Catholics. In fact, many of them are going to make their way down into Sicily and we're going to see their role, good and bad, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in, um, in, in Sicily and in southern um, Italy. Uh, the constant, slow progression of the reconversion of Spain. Um, so there you have successes mm -hmm. that are happening. Before we go much further, what, I, what we're going to do is we're going to shift gears and uh, next time around we're going to look at how the Europeans defended themselves against the Magyars, the Vikings, and the Muslims. Because what they do by using the technology that's available to them and then by adopting a new form of governance called feudalism they're going to put together a new, very creative kind of civilization. And the church is going to become involved in this because feudalism is going to have an effect on the church, a not a healthy effect on the church. And we need to see how the church is really, after what the church has gone through with all of these raids and, and all, what's going to hurt the church most is going to be security. Oh, okay. And because of the security arrangements that are made by the Europeans, the church itself, especially the hierarchy, is going to be very, very um, uh, distressed. And, and I mean that in the full sense, the almost the um, engineering sense of that word. It, there's going to be a horrible distress, and ultimately the church has going to ha is going to have to reform itself. And this great reformation that takes place, it's sometimes called the Gregorian Reformation, this great reformation that takes place is one of the great stories of the Middle Ages and one of the, I think one of the great glories of the centralization of, or unification of the church around Peter. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Father. Okay. Can we close with a prayer and your sure. blessing? Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it was, was in, in the beginning, beginning is now, and ever shall, shall be, world, world without, without end. end. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.